Well, um, good morning. Yes, still morning here in uh, in the Scottish borders. Just make sure everything is running as it should do. Yes, seems to be okay. Yeah. Well, um, and the sound, well, as bad as usual. <laughs> so, first of all, um, something I wanted to share with you. I was sent this uh, a few days ago, possibly longer, by... Um, Dude's auntie. So let me pop this up on the screen. Let you see this. She took all the t-shirts, a lot of the t-shirts. The dude had a huge collection of t-shirts and made them into this, what we would call a throw, a blanket of some sort. Anyway, um, they're not crystal clear on this photograph, so I will just run through what we've got. Obviously, we've got a, a T-shirt of, well, <laughs> obviously in the corner, we all know who this fella is. Um, this, incidentally, this tie here, this tartan tie was the, the very first thing I sent him all those years ago. Um, that's the, the bag that he got in... Um, Australia when we went to the first place where he managed to get himself a, a Dr. Pepper. Uh, obviously, we've got one of Linda's pieces of art, along with his favourite uh, Doors poster, his um, Abbey Road poster of the Beatles. As I say, that's the... And, and also, obviously, we've got a picture of him there. Um, that's the um, Abbey Road poster here. Uh, that's actually an Avery Salvage Yard T-shirt. Uh, we've got a Cozy Wrecking Crew T-shirt. I believe it's uh, it says on the on the corner above his uh, left side. I think it said the dude. Um, for some reason, we've got Dr Pepper mentioned here. Um, no, no, what's that one there? Hold on a sec. Let me go back to here. Oh, yes. This one says, Disingenuosity Free Zone. <laughs> We've got one of his Metallica T-shirts. We've got a, um, a LA um, giveaway crew. Um, I presume that's to do with the uh, his favorite baseball team, the Dodgems. Um, this one here. <laughs> It's, it's, I've never seen him wear this one. It says, the beatings will continue until morale improves. <laughs> um, I've never seen him wear this one either. Drunk chicks dig me. <laughs> Obviously, we know all about this. Uh, this is the, one of the Brendan Dassey control question T-shirts. Copyright Eric Jose. We've got another. This was the rally T-shirt from I think two years ago. We all live. Sorry, we all live on Avery Road. I live on Avery Road. Um, that one looks like it's from a famous film, uh, but I would not have any idea. But it does say uh, thirty-three USA, so it's obviously some sort of stamp. Um, and then, of course, here we have the Manitowoc Minute. Charlie Bones t-shirt so uh, auntie put all that together and made it into a, a throw uh, the idea I think um, is to uh, auction it off at some point um, to help raise money for a foundation that she wants to set up um, in the dude's name okay um, so that's the uh, the t-shirts all made into a nice Throw there. Now, um, what's the next thing I wanted to look at? Let's go straight to it. Um, on today is the start of Hanukkah, uh, which is uh, I, I'd never heard of it until about two weeks ago. I came across it in a book of music 
the guitar, which was, although it was Christmas music, it was actually, as it described, it was, it was holiday music from around the world, seasonal holiday music from around the world. So, for example, the first item on the, on the music book was Auld Lang Syne. Well, of course, Auld Lang Syne is certainly nothing to do with Christmas. It sang at, at New Year. It's a very famous Burns song. Um, and Hanukkah, although it starts today, is somewhat similar, obviously, to our Christmas, but it lasts for eight days. Um, what's it about? Let's have a look. If I go here... Uh, Jerusalem history, the first and second temples. Let's clear that. There we go. As it says here, no visitor to Jerusalem can, can escape hearing references to the first temple and the second temple, which refer to historical time periods when two different massive temples stood approximately where the Alask, Alaska marks. Al-Aqsa Mosque, Mosque is now located. Both temples were destroyed and the main remnant is the outer western wall of the second temple courtyard where people flock from all over the world to pray, known as the Wailing Wall, the Kotel or the Western Wall. Um, I've actually got some pictures, artist impressions of the various temples. Uh, this is quite an interesting one. Oh, I like this one. This is a representation of um jerusalem um obviously not to scale i think this was an artist impression from around about the 1700s um with the temple here in in the middle um that can't actually be true because we hear that uh solomon whilst he did build, build this huge temple about a thousand bc uh he also built himself an even bigger palace which took even longer to complete anyway so that was that's an artist impression of the uh, the first temple which is very nice and here we've got a similar artist impression of the second temple uh, what are we talking about here then so let's go back the Hanukkah is known as the festival of the lights. They light um, lights on what's called the menorah, which is like the big candlestick with um, eight candles on it. Um, and actually the Hanukkah celebrates the, um, the building and the rededication of this second temple. So according to Jewish traditions, both temples were destroyed on the 9th of Av on the Jewish calendar every year these these those destructions are marked by the day of mourning called tisha bav there are several other tragic dates in jewish history associated with tish bav, tisha bav but because of its relation to the destruction of the temples the plaza of the western wall is filled with throngs of jewish mourners every tisha bav during the first temple period so 1200 to 586 bc the first temple was built in about a thousand BC by King Solomon after King David conquered Jerusalem. So Solomon was David's son, David, who famously uh, conquered Goliath with his sling um, and made it his capital. Um, David always wanted to build a, a temple, uh, but it was King Solomon, his son, that actually got the job done however the temple was destroyed in 586 by nebuchadnezzar the king of babylon when he conquered jerusalem there are scant remains of the temple on the south hill of the city of david evidence of the conquering and destruction of the city can be found in the burnt house and the house of the belay from the first temple period in 701 bc there are significant remains of preparations made by King Hezekiah when a siege on the city by Sennacherib, king of Assyria, was imminent. Those remains include Hezekiah's tunnel and the broad well in the Jewish quarter. Beginning of the Second Temple period, 586 
AD 70 is marked by the return of Jews to Jerusalem from their exile in Babylon in 538 BC. They were allowed to return under an edict issued by King uh, Cyrus, King of Persia. Uh, by 515, the reinstated Jewish residents had completed building the second temple. So as I say, that's what is celebrated in um, the uh, Hanukkah, the building of the second temple. Um, and we've got a load more information about it here, which uh, I, I can pop it in the link. That's no problem at all. Anyway. Here we go. This this article, by the way, is is several several years years old. Let me show you the Tal Talmudic tradition of making a murderer. It comes as I say, this article is from 2016. Um, sort of late 2016, as you'll see by the information in it, which isn't quite up to date. So at the heart of a riveting Netflix documentary on a questionable murder conviction is the suspect's own confession. That evidence is seen as problematic in Jewish law and by the lawyer who ultimately exonerated Brendan Dassey. Well, of course, as I say, we now know that that, that decision was appealed, but back then, this was the, the uh, a view from um, Jerusalem, from Israel. Obviously, we've got Brendan there. So. Yes, here we go. This was published by Mira Sukarov on the 17th of August 2016. And then it says here 10th of April 2018. So, okay. So, when clinical law professor and attorney Steve Drizzen who traces his lineage to some of the founders of the Lubavitch, 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 yeah, Hasidic movement, sits down to work every day, a phrase from Deuteronomy, stares down at him from a poster on his office wall. Justice, justice, thou shalt pursue. It's a singular focus that has helped the wrongfully convicted, including many of Steve Drizzen's clients, regain hope. So as I say, this was at a period when the conviction had been overturned. So um, among the most notable of those clients is Brendan Dassey, who, along with his uncle, Stephen Avery, was featured in the recent 10 episode Netflix documentary series, Making a Murderer. Brendan was 16 when he was convicted in 2007 of murdering Teresa Holbach. Last week, the US District Court in Milwaukee overturned that conviction with the help of Steve Drizzen, his appeals lawyer. So we, we're referring to Obviously, William Duffin. Das's original, Brendan's original trial relied on his confession that he helped, had helped his uncle rape and murder Teresa Holbach, a photographer who had visited Avery's auto salvage yard in Wisconsin's Manitowoc County for a photo assignment. In heartbreaking video footage of the interrogations, viewers of the series were privy to the police tactics used to elicit Das's statements. Last week, the judge ruled the confession involuntary under the 5th and 14th Amendments. And in a separate process, Steve's lawyer is also trying to exonerate him. And doing very well indeed.
Steve Drizzen is co-founder of North Western University's Centre on Wrongful Convictions of Youth, the legal clinic that picked up Das's case at the post-conviction stage. He is also an expert on false confessions. His groundbreaking study on the topic, co-authored with Richard, Richard A. Leo, and of course we've had uh, a look at that whole document, and of course we've had the pleasure of Richard Leo joining us on the Dudes channel, I believe it was back in May. Um, they examined 125 cases of suspects later found to be innocent who had nevertheless confessed. You know, this notion that innocent people don't confess, Tom Fallon, you know perfectly well that is absolute nonsense. There, Stephen Richards' 2004 article has been widely cited from the United States Supreme Court to Rabbi Joseph Delishkin, an American lecturer and best-selling author. False confessions, Steve, Steve explains, rank up there as a leading cause of wrongful convictions. Uh, of, of course, mistaken eyewitness, he says, is the number one cause, at least in cases that have involved exonerations based on DNA evidence, a method that's only been available since 1989. Now, roughly half of US states require interrogations to be recorded, up from only two in 1995. Steve would like to see laws which would require the courts to assess the reliability of a given confession before it is presented to the jury. That's part of what my scholarship is about. It parallels what some of Jewish law scholars have said, but it's not influenced by that. Jewish legal tradition, which long predates these public policy debates, seem to offer some relevant and wise insights on this issue. Dating from Talmudic times, Jewish law, in fact, does not allow confessions as admissible evidence in serious criminal proceedings. Specifically, the Talmud holds that a person cannot self-incriminate in outlawing confession in capital proceedings, the rabbis explains Talmud, Tal, Talmudist and Rabbi Joshua Katz. Now, as soon as I saw this Katz, I thought, oh, don't tell me Kratz. Don't tell me that's a Jewish name as well. No, definitely not. It's German. I've looked it up and it meant uh, various things, in fact, uh, not just um, the... Uh, what, what did it mean? It, first of all, it meant somebody who um, um, cards wool, a wool carder, somebody who processes wool. Uh, and, of course, pulling the wool over somebody's eyes would definitely rank as something suitable for um, an explanation of Kratz's surname. There's, a, there's another meaning for the surname Kratz, and I'd like to try and find that for you right now. So just bear with me. Let's 
let's have a look. Oh, that was it, yeah. <laughs> so, Kratz means, um, in its original sense, meant a, somebody who cards wool, a wool carder, somebody who pulls wool, processes wool, tries to pull the wool over people's eyes, and <laughs> it's from an old personal name formed from Old High German Gratag, meaning greedy. <laughs> so, how appropriate. Anyway, so, yeah. Luckily, K A T Z might be a, um, a, Jew a Jewish Israeli surname. Kratz is not. Anyway, um, where do we get to? Specifically, the Talmud holds that a person cannot self incriminate in outlawing confession in capital proceedings. The rabbis, explains Talmud's rabbi Yosher Katz, were trying to avoid capital punishment as much as possible. That's why they called a court that kills more than one criminal in 70 years murderous. In A Code of Jewish Ethics, Volume 2, Love Your Neighbor as Yourself, Rabbi Joseph Telishkin also applies a Jewish lens to call into question the function of confession. He too cites Drizin and Leo while quoting Mammonides. The court shall not put a man to death on his own confession for it is possible that he was confused in mind when he made the confession. In a chilling video clip in the Netflix series that illustrates that possibility. Dassey tells Bob, they got to my head. It's a clip which the jury in Brendan's original murder trial never got to see. It's counterintuitive, Steve says, that anybody would confess to a crime they didn't commit. But juries must realise that just because the police and the prosecutors say that someone is guilty because they confessed doesn't necessarily mean they are. Meanwhile, while the innocent person is locked up, it's often the case that the true guilty person is out there committing other murders or rapes. In their study, uh, Steve Drizzen and Richard Leo found that the longer the interrogation, the greater the risk of false confession. Well, of course, they spent all weekend at Fox Hills preparing him. Um, and there were several interviews that we've got certain recordings and transcripts for. And then finally, they got what they wanted March 1st. Um, so for me, Brendan's confession was a very, very long, drawn out over several days. And of course, Brendan still remembered his original encounter in Marinette County with uh, I think it's Officer Anthony O'Neill, when he says, you've got nothing to worry about. We're not going to arrest you. OK. There is also the problem of police being permitted to lie to suspects about evidence they have apparently amassed. And this is without doubt the biggest problem in all of this. The US Supreme Court has, has upheld this practice since 1969 in a move Drizzen describes as a function of the courts being overtly deferential to law enforcement agencies. However, actual fabrication of evidence is prohibited in some states, partly out of fear that the phony evidence might be used during court proceedings. Well, that's a bit of a, a no-brainer, isn't it? Hmm. 
you can obviously see Ray, Ray Edelstein there. And I'm pretty sure that this guy here, which we only can see a little bit of it, that's Daniel Hartwick. He's the new sheriff of Manitrop that took over from uh, my good pal, <laughs> Robert Herman. He's <laughs> probably, I don't know if he's enjoying his retirement or not. Anyway, he's no longer in uh, Cleveland Motor Auto, Auto Salvage. They sold up, particularly with young, intellectual, compromised or otherwise vulnerable suspects, all of which describe Brendan Dassey. Implied threats or promises of leniency can lead an innocent person to feel helpless. Fact feeding is especially problematic. In rare cases, social psychologists have discovered that some innocent people faced with misleading claims about evidence against them actually come to believe they committed the crime. Well, that's exactly the Marty Tancliffe situation, isn't it? Where they were told, he was told that his dad had regained consciousness and had told police that Marty had done it. So he started to think, could I have done it? Police who elicit false confessions aren't necessarily acting with malice. Huh. Unlike in instances of framing, police sometimes just get carried away, Drizzen explains, especially if they believe someone to be guilty. I think you are being very, very charitable there, Steve. I think you are being very charitable indeed. In the context of the Dassey trial, these dynamics are analysed in a video presentation by Steve and his co-counsel, co Laura. Their work on the case is featured in episode 10 of Making a Murderer. Netflix announced last month that new episodes are planned. And of course, the, the, the main video presentation you need to watch is the, um, the true story of a false confession. It's about two hours long but it goes through the case in, in great detail. And if you haven't watched it, it is well worth watching. A true story of a false confession. I will pop the link in the description below. Uh, speaking to an audience at Northwestern, Steve described the police process in Brendan's case as one of the worst cases of police contamination I have seen in over 20 years of looking at interrogations. And of course, we're talking particularly, aren't we, about, you know, we get blurting out, we're, I'm just going to, I'm just fed up of trying to get you to guess something. So I'm just going to ask you who shot her in the head. That's, you know, that's probably the, the best example. Well, I'm sure that's the one that Steve is, look, is referring to. At the centre on, of wrong, on wrongful convictions of youth, Steve and his team, who take on cases on a pro bono basis, receive more than 200 letters a month from inmates, part of a network of nearly 70 innocence projects all around the world. Steve and his team gather documents, talk to people involved in the original conviction, if possible, and make our best judgment about whether we believe the client is innocent and whether we think we can prove it. I say some of this isn't up to date. Brendan has been imprisoned in a maximum security correctional facility in Wisconsin for a decade. Now the state has 90 days to decide whether it wants to retry him, appeal the decision, or simply allow him to move on with his life. Steve will visit Brendan next week as the legal team awaits the state's response. We are prepared to go as far as we need to go to bring Brendan home. Steve tells Haritz he is a firm believer in Tikkun Olam, 
repairing the world. And the notion that if you save the life of one person, you heal a breach in the community and you essentially save the world. I've tried to live my life, he says, by adhering to those principles. Now, with his hoped for release from prison, Brendan will also have the chance to choose how to live the rest of his life. Okay, so um, let's say it was interesting to look at the uh, point of view from, well, let's say the Middle East. We know that uh, we've got people all around the world interested in this case. Uh, so, as I say, there was a uh, another instance. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna say cheerio. Uh, must must crack on. Um, so the um stuff i need to pop in the description i need to um include that true, true story of a false confession i will pop in the two articles that we've just looked at so you can read them at your leisure at your pleasure okie dokie i will um also cheerio thank you all for uh, joining yet again um until next time bye for now